Okay, so there's electrons inside atoms. This leads to more questions, which this is how research works. You find one thing, and then that sprouts out in a whole bunch of directions. And you have to choose which rabbit hole to go down. And some of them lead to nowhere, and some of them lead to more rabbit holes um, and cool stuff. So if there's negative charges in there, there must be positive charges, because the atoms themselves were neutral. Well, so now we know there must be positive charges. Are there more particles than just the positive and the negative one? Is this just a jumble of a whole bunch of particles? Yes. Yes, it is. Are they solid spheres? Is there some internal structure? Is it organized in any way? Lots and lots of questions. So Thompson came up with a model that's referred to as the plum pudding model. I've never seen plum pudding. Um, that's a British dessert, but um, I'm told that it's a lot like, well, maybe that's not like a blueberry muffin, but a blueberry muffin is good for this analogy. So we're gonna call this a blueberry muffin model for the atom. In this model, we've got this sphere of positive charge, and that's like the cakey muffin part. And then we've got electrons in there, and those are like the blueberries just kind of scattered around inside the muffin. Okay, you gotta start somewhere. No? Okay. Um, before we can continue, we need just a tiny bit of knowledge about radioactivity. Radioactivity is when an unstable nucleus just shoots out particles spontaneously. This was discovered by Becquerel and Curie. And using these particles, we can probe the atom and we can study it. There's three types, alpha, beta, and gamma. The alpha particles were what was used here. They have a positive charge and they're the most massive. If you're interested in radioactivity, chapter 21, and that's covered in Chem 1B. So Rutherford was working with Thompson, and he set out to test the model. He was trying to confirm the model. So what he did is he took these positively charged alpha particles and shot them at a very thin piece of gold foil. So it looks something like this. So he's got a source of these alpha particles shooting a beam at this really thin piece of gold foil. Well, if, if this is like a blueberry muffin and you're shooting these little teeny tiny things at it, what, what do we expect to happen? We expect that the particles are just gonna go straight through, right? And most of them did, but some of them bounced back. And that was shocking. So Rutherford said it was about as credible as if you had fired a 15-inch shell or cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. It was like, I mean, it was just a jaw drop, right? Okay, so blueberry muffin model doesn't work. Have to come up with something new. This is the blueberry muffin model. Um, here we're expecting these particles to just go straight through. The actual result led to um, a nuclear model where we have a nucleus and inside the nucleus are the protons and neutrons. This is where almost all the mass is. And then around that we have a cloud of electrons and the electrons are super tiny. And so this part of the atom is mostly empty space. So if you're shooting alpha particles through this, mostly empty space, of course they're gonna go straight through, unless they hit the nucleus. The nucleus has a positive charge, the alpha particle has a positive charge, so it's gonna get away as fast as it can, it's gonna bounce back. You can imagine taking an airsoft gun and shooting little airsoft pellets at like a volleyball net Volleyball net has you know, these big squares uh, that are open and strings in between. Most of the time, you're gonna just hit the holes, but every once in a while, you'll hit the string and it'll bounce back. It's not gonna do much damage, but it'll bounce back. So that's what was happening. 
So this led to the nuclear theory of the atom. These are the basic parts. Most of the atom's mass and all of its positive charge are in the nucleus, this small part in the middle. Most of the volume of the atom is empty space. And in that empty space, we have teeny tiny negatively charged electrons. There's an equal number of negatively charged electrons and positively charged particles. And those particles were given the name protons. So equal number of protons and electrons, and that's how an atom is neutral in charge. So all very nice, but still there were some problems. One of the problems was hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen has one proton, helium has two protons. So we would expect that the mass of helium is twice as much as hydrogen, right? But it's four times as much. There's got to be something else in there. So they found out later what that was. And there are neutral particles called neutrons also in the nucleus. So in the nucleus, we've got the positive protons and the neutral neutrons. And then in mostly empty space around it, we have the electrons. And that's the nuclear model of the atom. Um, the mass of a neutron is extremely similar to that of a proton. For most of our purposes, we can just say they're the same. This explains the difference in masses. So a hydrogen atom has a proton and no neutrons. A helium atom is four times as massive because it has two protons and two neutrons. So it's got four of these massive particles compared to hydrogen's one. That nucleus is extremely dense. It's not black hole dense, but you know, it's definitely way far down in that direction. Occupies over 99.9% .9 of the mass of the atom, but occupies little space. So, so how do we even think about this? Well, you could think about a cloud or fog, right? What, what is fog? Well, fog is just a cloud that's formed down here where we are and it gets in our way. So fog, you've got these little tiny droplets of water in mostly just regular old air, right? But you can't see through it, even though these particles are so tiny you can barely see them. But the fog is mostly empty space. You can just walk through it, right? It's not like a solid, you just walk through it. So that's a little bit like what an atom is. The electrons are like the water droplets in the fog. Um, when we look at a piece of matter like the bench top, it looks pretty uniform, right? It doesn't look like it's made up of a whole bunch of little tiny pieces, and yet it is. If the nucleus was the size of a period, a printed period, the electrons would be 10 meters away. I measured with the meter stick. That'd be like if okay, we stick a proton on the door over there, and the closest electrons are way over here on the other side of, of the classroom. A period, just teeny tiny, right? What's, it, what's the rest of the atom? It's mostly empty space. If you could get solid nuclei, just, just the nuclei without the empty space, without the electrons, and you put them together and have it be the size of a grain of sand, a little grain of sand, it would weigh 11 million pounds. A grain of sand, 11 million pounds. The nucleus is extremely dense. Scaffolding the size of a football field that's 100 stories high is mostly empty space. We have scaffolding on the outside of our new science building that's coming up. It's mostly empty space, and, you know, little metal bars and some wood planks, but mostly empty space. So imagine a structure made out of that, mostly empty space. In that structure the size of a football field and 100 stories tall, the nucleus would be the size of a pea. Bigger than that period, but you know, super, super small. Well, 
why does matter look as it does? I was going to say, why does it look solid? But I mean, when you're talking about what is a solid, then you can't use that. Um, why can't we see through it? Why doesn't matter just pass through each other? Even though it's mostly empty space, it's like taking two of these scaffolding structures, mostly empty space, and knocking them together, right? That's like your, your knuckles wrapping on the bench top. Your knuckles have atoms in them, right? Like these, these structures, but super tiny, right? But they can't go through each other. They don't fall into each other. Matter appears solid because the variation in density is too small for us to see it. If you, if you zoom way out of this giant structure, it's, it's going to start to look solid, right? Like it's all the same. But when you zoom in, you see that there are definitely different pieces. Anybody have any questions about that? I think this little part, this past couple of slides, I think this is the most interesting part of the whole chapter, honestly. 